Hi, my name is Nate Norman. Today is Friday, April 3rd, and we are here for our virtual first Friday, the first of its kind. Today, we are giving away this really cool Bowser canvas. This is an original spray painted canvas with the uh, Perler Beat Sprite on top. So if you ask some questions down in the comments and I answer them, we will put your name into a drawing to take this little guy home. So I'm here to uh, showcase some of my art today. And as you can see behind me all around, I've got um, kind of a combination of what we call perler beads, bead sprites, and uh, spray paint art. I was born in Visalia, grew up in Exeter, kind of drew, was into art kind of my whole life. I remember watching Bob Ross on TV as a kid, really inspired. Got my master's in psychology and started working on art on the side, and it's just kind of taken off from there. Like I said, I used to draw a lot as a kid. I've always been kind of interested in it. I've wanted to, but I didn't have something to kind of push me into it. Um, my sister started, um, she was gonna sell at a convention. She was like, I don't know if I have enough artwork to sell at a table. So I thought, okay, I used to do perler beads as a kid. We used to make magnets for mom and dad and grandma's presents. So I was like, wait, I can make some video game characters out of this, help you fill the table. So I had two months to crank out perler beads and get ready for this thing. And then I had one sale. Awesome. And it was like a $5 sale too. I started off just selling like the beaded characters with no background. Um, when you have those, you, they pile up, you've got nowhere to display them. When you've got a canvas, a background, like a living scene for them, it's a little more exciting, a little more unique. Being able to go out and show off my art to people at these conventions where hundreds and hundreds of people are seeing it and getting excited about it was really encouraging. It really got me to go after it, find time in my everyday, find time after work to get started on this. And it's turned into this and then spray painting, painting on the side on top of this. Um, so if you're not familiar with perler beads, it's a very tedious uh, art form, I guess. So you take the beads one at a time, put them on a pegboard, lay out your pattern, take out some masking tape so they stick together, flip it over, pull out your iron, and you're gonna iron them until they melt. And so that once they melt, you've got a completely flat side which you can use to glue onto the canvas. Some people melt both sides so it's a little more durable, but I prefer to iron one side so you get a really uniform front side that's clean and open. If you've got fat fingers, I like to use tweezers because I'll uh, go to put one down and knock everything everywhere. An iron, masking tape helps, the pegboards, and then your uh, different perler beads. After you iron it, you need something heavy to kind of flatten it out. Helps because uh, they want to curl up if you don't iron both sides, and that can be a big pain in the butt. Once I've got my character ironed all planned out, I'll take a canvas, pick a size for them, and I will you know, pick my colors, whatever, spray paint a scene, let it dry, give it a varnish, and we're good to go. I've had um, a couple issues of people actually stealing my artwork and trying to sell it as their own, which is a little frustrating. But um, there's not a lot of measures in place to protect the small artists. Big businesses, on the other hand, like, they got people cracking down right and left. So with my artwork, I don't do any recreations. I don't do prints. Everything you're buying is an original. So they can buy the original, they can show off the original, um, but people claiming it as their own, they're not gonna be able to reproduce the exact copy. Even people who want to say, rebuy something that's sold out, it's gonna come out different because I'm not gonna be able to exactly recreate the painting or the positioning or, so everybody, even if you want like the same piece, you're getting a recreation of it. So it's a little bit different. You got something unique. When I first started out, I would do, I'd get an idea in my head, I'd go out, I'd paint the painting, and then I'd make the character out of perler beads, and then slap it on there and go, oh God, he doesn't fit the canvas. So then I started creating the characters, and I would just go knock out all these characters I'm interested in, and I'd plan the paintings around what the character is, or how I feel about the scene that these characters could create. like. Um, say like this one piece one for instance um, this was a really fun one to work with 
So I had to do a lot of customization with this. I had two reference materials of Luffy kicking and then Crocodile laughing. And so I had to sort of extend the leg and have sand shooting out of them and make this dynamic scene on top of this painted background. So the characters came first and then I had to plan the scene around that. So um, I eyeball it right now. There's three big brands with beads. There's Perler, Artcal, and Hama. All of them have different um, color palettes and melting times. So I've sticked to Perler because it's easiest to get around here. So we've got like in the reds, we've got like five different shades of reds. So when you're going off your reference or the image you've created, you just kind of eyeball it, see which one's the darkest and get your gradient going from darkest to lightest and kind of work in the range you've got. Some of the more detailed pieces, I'll like put the guy together and then go, I don't like this, remove it, swap the colors to a different gradient, maybe from lightest to darkest as opposed to darkest to lightest and go. So as a kid, we'd buy the big 2000 assorted tubs. You'd have all these colors and you have to sort through, find your color and you can spell out your name or make a shape. And now you can buy them by like individual colors and we've got like 200 something colors. So you can create like these ridiculous detailed pieces from there. So there's a lot of trial and error involved in it. But the nice thing is you're not locked in like you are with paint. You don't have to go back over. You just pull your beads back off. Time consuming, but it's not permanent until you iron it. I've been working on this Mario piece recently. And so uh, I'm sure you, a lot of you are familiar with Super Mario World. So I was looking at the Mario sprite and if you zoom in, like a lot of his pixels in his red cap aren't even red. There's like a lot of browns and other shades in there that when you zoom out and you're seeing it from the game, it just looks like outlines on a red cap. Like, it's interesting to see the detail and how these companies and these developers worked around the limited color range and what they had to create these uh, unique characters that we still recognize however many years later. We actually built a 20 foot wall so that I could have a large place to paint and that was pretty fun. I, um, I've always been a big fan of graffiti art. Um, I was trying to get into it legally, <laughs> but there is a, there's a large learning curve. So even though I've been doing it for a year or two, I've still got a long way to go. So with spray paint, I'm a big fan of because for canvases and paintings like this, you're painting really quickly because you're working with layers to try and get your blends and gradients going. You're using, um, let's say like newspaper, magazine paper to peel up layers before it dries, using palette knives to scrape, get some detail. Yeah, actually, um, one of the ones who uh, was really encouraging when I first got started, it was at that first con. Um, we were at a con in Bakersfield. I was selling, I wasn't selling anything. So I'm like, okay, it's slow. I'm gonna go take a walk around, meet some of the other people. And there was another artist. He goes by Zomb Eric on Instagram. And um, he had some stuff. He had this really cool uh, Luffy piece of him standing like on the beach. And I was like, dang, how long have you been doing this? Like, how'd you get the idea for painting and blah, blah, blah. And he was just really encouraging. I ended up buying one of his pieces and I have it hung up to a lot of artwork in my house right now. And through um, Instagram, I've met a couple other artists. I've got one in, I wanna say Canada. I just bought one of his paintings. He did a realistic Sonic from the movie and um, I went in an auction <laughs> and that thing is sitting right above my TV. It's like 30 by 40, it's crazy. But yeah, so there's other artists doing it. It's just um, around here, I don't know of any. I know a couple that are doing just the beads but I haven't seen anyone painting with the beads around here. When I go to like bigger cities, I've got other people competing <laughs> for the sales but we've all got different styles. I got a Game Boy Color for like my fifth Christmas and I took that thing everywhere. Uh, played Pokemon all the time. So Pokemon's been a big inspiration for a lot of my pieces. Um, big fan of One Piece, so I've been making a lot of those. Digimon was huge when I was a kid. So uh, Digimon Pokemon are big. A lot of the Disney stuff has been fun because I grew up with that too. It's getting a little harder to do stuff based on um, newer video games because of how much the graphics have improved. So you gotta do a lot more of, um, you gotta get creative with it. The references are a lot higher ref resolution. 
So um, either you're gonna end up with this giant perler bead piece, or you're gonna scale it down and get really creative with how you um, create the sprite for it. So I try to stick to like NES, Game Boy Advanced, older video game stuff, so I have closer reference to what I'm working with. For me personally, it's exciting to see these characters like recreated. Um, personally, like my favorite piece I've ever done right here, Omnimon from, uh, if any of you are familiar with the Digimon movie, came out in, I wanna say 99 or 2001. But so, love that movie as a kid. This was always one of my favorite Digimon, but because he's so large, it was, um, always an intimidating task to even take on because I was like, where am I going to keep this? This isn't going to sell. But um, bringing in the life on the canvas was probably one of my favorite things to do because of how much he sticks out, how large of a piece, how how cool it looks. <laughs> but um, so yeah, recreating this stuff that I loved as a kid in three dimensions, popping off a canvas in your face has been personally exciting for me and it's even more exciting to see people get excited about what I'm already excited about. My audience is pretty interesting. I've got a lot of um, people my age and older, a lot of grandparents are asking questions about this is what my kid likes, do you have anything based on this? So I was trying to give them <laughs> honest feedback on what I had related to what their kid was looking for for Christmas or birthday or whatever's coming up. And then I've got a lot of kids <laughs> that really like this stuff. Like, Tasty Arts last year, I had kids forking out like allowance money and stuff like that to take home a bunch of these pieces. So I was trying to, you know, cut them deals because I remember being a kid and it's tough to come up with money. For the beaded stuff, that's pretty important because that's the main selling point. People get really excited about the characters and they want to take home the piece. I've had, like this Ultraman for one, <laughs> I don't have a lot of people recognize Ultraman because um, it's kind of hitting the wrong audience with that. I've got a lot of people, I don't think anyone doesn't recognize Pikachu up here, or even the Fox and the Hound is a newer one I did. But um, some of the more obscure stuff, even One Piece, I get people asking what that is, even though One Piece is like, I think it's sold more copies than Batman and Superman at this point. With some of my original stuff, they don't have to recognize the subject matter because I'll do some more surreal space scenery stuff where that appeals to a wider audience. But um, sometimes it's a little less exciting to do and people get a little less excited about it because they're not like, oh, I remember this from when I was a kid. I grew up with this. People get really excited about seeing the familiar characters like Pikachu. I think for a lot of people, you can always be your worst critic. But at conventions and stuff, I do run into the occasional person that says, hey, I can do that. Why am I going to buy your stuff? And I was like, okay, that's really cool. Like, if you can do it, you should go do it and show me. I'd love to see it. So um, I don't think there's really a good way to respond to negative criticism. Just don't give them the satisfaction of beating you down because... Everybody's learning, everybody's improving. There's no reason for you to let these negative people that aren't doing what you're doing discourage you, especially if you're just starting out. So if you're interested in taking home one of these pieces or even having something custom made, you can contact me at my email, starvingsquid at gmail.com or on Instagram at Starving Squid. I need to get around to making a Facebook. But so on my Instagram, I have an entire basically catalog of everything I've made. So if you wanna take a look through what I've got, it'll be marked as sold, or if it's not, it'll be for sale. If you're interested in a custom piece, shoot me a message, shoot me an email, and we can talk uh, details and pricing. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, this has been a really exciting event to do our first virtual first Friday. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments. Don't forget about our giveaway. If I answer any of your questions, you are entered for the drawing. And uh, feel free to reach out. If you have any questions about the work I'm doing or work you want to see done, I'm always looking for new ideas or maybe if you want to take one of these home.